uh, friends, colleagues, it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce the opening keynote lecture of 2020 Vision, the 33rd biennial conference of our Uni European Association for American Studies. Although we have been forced slightly out of sync by the pandemic and we are not able to convene in person this time, we are gathered in spirit as well as in technology in ways that could not have been imagined 20 years ago or in 1920 or certainly not in 1620. Ladies and gentlemen, our opening keynote lecture will be delivered this year by Professor Michelle Burnham from Santa Clara University, way out west in Silicon Valley, where it's just gone 7.30 in the morning. So we're really very pleased that Professor Burnham is here with us at this time and that her alarms have obviously worked and that transatlantic, transpacific, and satellite technologies are able to bring her to us today. Professor Burnham, you're very welcome. Professor Burnham is currently the Director of the Centre for the Arts and Humanities at Santa Clara, an institution she has worked at since 1997, before which she taught at Auburn University in Alabama, having completed her doctoral studies at SUNY Buffalo. She is the editor of the new series, Reeditions with Lever Press, this is a series that will publish digital editions of recovered literary and cultural texts. She is also the author of numerous works that examine systems of critical and cultural exchange within the broader scope of global American studies from colonial times to the present day. These works include the books Captivity and Sentiment, Cultural Exchange in American Literature, 1682 to 1861. That was from 1997. Folded Cells, Colonial New England Writing in the World System, 2007, and most recently from 2019, Trans-Oceanic America, Risk, Writing and Revolution in the Global Pacific. Professor Burnham has also edited The Female American or The Adventures of Unka Eliza Wingfield by Unka Eliza Wingfield, that was in 2001, and A Separate Star, Selected Writings of Helen Hunt Jackson, 2008. She is also working on a new book under the tentative title, she tells me, of 70s Child, A Cultural Memoir. And many of us will get that. Professor Burnham's most recent monograph, Traverse Seas, and particularly the Pacific Ocean, as well as multiple generic categories such as travel writing, 18th century novels, and related questions of gender, race, and place. Transoceanic America highlights, as Professor Burnham herself notes, the value found not only in rereading literary texts from a given period, but in rethinking the roles of expectation and prolongation in dominant narratives of literary and cultural history. We are honored to have Professor Burnham here with us today, and we can now settle back for a lecture already eagerly anticipated 12 months ago, let alone now. The title is 1620 to 2020, Colonies, Corporations and Constructing American Cultural Histories. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Michelle Burnham. Thank you so much, Philip, for that very kind introduction. Uh, thank you also to Susanna and to the EAAS for the opportunity to be a part of this conference. Uh, it truly is uh, an honor uh, to be here. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start my screen sharing. Um, there we go. <clears throat> Although the title of my talk starts with the year 1620, I'm actually going to begin the talk itself with the year 1619. That's because two years ago in 2019, the New York Times launched the by now very well-known uh, 1619 project. Begun by journalist Nicole Hannah Jones, the 1619 Project is dedicated to recentering the narrative of American cultural history around the existence of slavery, beginning with the arrival in that year of a ship at a port near the Jamestown colony in Virginia called Point Comfort. That ship carried over 20 enslaved peoples, the first to arrive in North America's English colonies. At the core of this tremendous project is the effort to name and see slavery from America's outset and to narrate its continuing legacies in US culture and history in everything from democracy 
science, and zoning practices to music, sports, and the consumption of sugar. A recent article by Michelle M. Wright, published in the journal American Literary History, describes the 1619 project as an effort to drop kick 1776 from its organizing role in the public imagination of US history. If Hannah Jones's Twitter profile is any indication, her goal was precisely this, removing the Declaration of Independence, the American Revolution, and the handful of white men associated with them, we have taken to calling founding fathers from their dominating presence in the narrative circuitry of American cultural history. Wright's article title, which is 1619, The Danger of a Single Origin Story, draws on the title of novelist Chimamanda Adichie's widely viewed TED talk, The Danger of a Single Story. In that talk, Adichie points to the problem of allowing one story to shape and determine our perception of an entire community, country, or history. The story of one impoverished Nigerian man should no more stand in for the incredible diversity of peoples and experiences and countries within and across the continent of Africa, she insists, than the story of one white male American domestic terrorist should stand in for our perception of all Americans. Adichie and Wright are both concerned with narrative and its power to shape in limited and damaging ways our assumptions about the world, but they emphasize the role of slightly different narratological tools in doing so. Adichie's talk largely centers on character or protagonist, the real or fictional persons who populate narratives and the way their singular stories crowd out other competing or complicating stories. Wright's essay, by contrast, shifts the focus toward plot or what the historian and theorist Hayden White called emplotment, the connected series of events or episodes that form a narrative and that rely on established literary tropes and genres. According to Wright, despite telling an alternative origin story, the 1619 Project still tells a single origin story whose focus crowds out other stories about indigenous peoples, about other immigrants, about blacks whose arrival in America is through means other than slavery, about non-English colonialism. The 1619 Project takes a pair of scissors to the tight narrative band that stretches both backwards and forwards from 1776, and it secures a new band in its place. This is actually no mean feat, uh, given the industrial strength elastic of which that existing band seems to be made. Wright's point though, is that every time we replace one linear band with another linear band, we're starting from one point whose features determine which future points that band passes through. As a result, we will continue to miss all the stories that don't intersect with that band, and we will be inclined to see the stories that do align with it from a particular and limiting perspective. When the large, messy, contradictory, and unfinished historical archives are transformed into one historical line that has no holes or conflicts. We face not only the danger of a single origin story, but the danger of a linear story. Scholars working in American literary history of all periods have been challenging this traditional uh, narrat narrative for decades. But that work has predominantly adopted Adichie's strategy of multiplying protagonists uh, by recovering marginalized voices, forgotten texts, and alternative literary traditions that counteract the danger of a single story about America. Increasingly, I've begun to wonder if we have underestimated the power of emplotment to resist 
the cumulative effect of such multiplicity. It's not been enough to multiply stories about America because the 1776 narrative band, as I describe it in my recent book, Transoceanic America, exerts what amounts to a gravitational pull in our stories of American history and literature, often yanking efforts at alternative perspectives back into more familiar temporal and spatial terms. And of course, 1776 doesn't just shape the narrative of events, people, and perspectives that come afterwards. It shapes the narrative of events that come before it in the period of colonial American literary and cultural history. And scholars in my field have been grappling for decades with the way the retro determinative force of 1776 has worked cultural history of the colonial period in literature anthologies, historical textbooks and syllabi that continue to be saddled with texts, writers and episodes often cherry picked for their ability to predict what in that period would have been nothing less than an unfathomable narrative about the nation, its independence, and its purported embrace of freedom. Toni Morrison gives us one way of thinking about this tension between 1776 and 1619, between freedom and slavery in American cultural history in her essay, Playing in the Dark, where she says, it is as if I had been looking at a fishbowl, the glide and flick of the golden scales, the green tip, the bolt of white careening back from the gills, the castles at the bottom surrounded by pebbles and tiny intricate fronds of green, the barely disturbed water, the flecks of waste and food, the tranquil bubbles traveling to the surface. And suddenly, I saw the bowl, the structure that transparently and invisibly permits the ordered life it contains to exist in the larger world. Morrison's essay insists that you can't see freedom without slavery, just as Edmund Morgan's uh, argued in his 1975 book, American Freedom, American Slavery, that it was the pervasive presence of unfree people in America that allowed the very concept of freedom to take shape. But Morrison's description, I think, makes something else especially clear. The more you focus on the details of that freedom story, the more blurred, the more invisible slavery becomes, even as it remains absolutely necessary. Right? It's the bowl that holds this pleasing fantasy in place. By now, you may begin to wonder why 1620 is in the title of my talk. Uh, the 1619 Project isn't just an effort to center Black lives in American historical narrative. It isn't just an effort to look back 400 years from the vantage point of 2019. And it isn't just an effort to boot 1776 out of its narrative stranglehold on American history. In 2019, it was also a preemptive hijacking of any incipient 2020 plans for quadricentennial celebrations of our most familiar and dominant origin story, Plymouth Plantation. It was in 1620 that a small group of English colonists, whom we have learned to call the Pilgrims, settled in a place we have learned to call Plymouth, and whose experience we have been taught to understand retro determinatively as an origin story about freedom that laid the foundation for the first successful English settlement in the Americas. These have been the tools of emplotment that sutured 1620 to 1776. I'm gonna to return to this problem of emplotment and the danger of a linear story later in this talk, but I wanna turn now back to the colonial 17th century in order to consider an overlooked protagonist in all of these stories, which is the corporation. If slavery is the fishbowl that gives shape to the narrative of freedom 
then corporations are the table that supports that bowl. And the room in which this whole scenario is housed is not the nation or even an ocean, but the entire globe. The field of American literary studies was inaugurated in the 1960s by the pioneering Harvard University based work of Perry Miller and F.O. Matheson, which perhaps accounts for why New England has always had an outsized impact on narratives of American literary and cultural history. This is a slide I've taken um, from the Digital Humanities Project at Washington University in St. Louis called Early American uh, Anthologies. And um, this is the result of, of running a search on Norton and Heath anthologies uh, up to the year 1820, showing in blue how many of the writers included are New England versus those that are not. And as you can see, right, uh, we've basically moved from uh, about 45% uh, of it in the first Norton edition to 40% uh, in the most uh, uh, recent, recent one. Uh, when I wrote the book Folded Selves, um, I was interested in finding what got left out of this existing single story about the colonial origins of American literature. Uh, and that project began for me with a close reading of the entirety of William Bradford's diary of Plymouth Plantation. This is a big book from which small pieces have been carefully selected and included in the early pages of American literature anthologies and textbooks where it in traditionally inaugurates histories of settler writing in colonial North America. Now, everyone recognizes some of those excerpts, the departure of a small band of English religious dissidents from Holland on the ship, the Mayflower, the drawing up of the Mayflower Compact, the short account of the so-called first Thanksgiving. Those of us who teach early American literature recognize additional excerpts that describe the burning of the Pequot fort, the execution of a Plymouth man for sodomizing several farm animals, and Plymouth's confrontation with their non-Puritan English neighbor, Thomas Morton. When I made the commitment, not just to read, but actually to care about the entire 300 or so pages of this book from cover to cover, what I discovered is that it's mainly about money. It's about the troubled financial relationship between Plymouth colonists and their London investors. This is not the 1620 origin story with which we are familiar. Its plot is not about the triumph of freedom. Rather, it's about the tragedy of greed. Its story does not celebrate hardy individualism or set a foundation for a future nation. Instead, it's a story about the disintegration of community and the abandonment of the common good and that plays out between 1620 and more or less uh, 1647. The story is shaped above all by the entangled transatlantic business arrangements between Plymouth settlers and London investors and the relationships of inequality and exploitation on which they depend. Since writing uh, Fold Itself, I've realized the necessity of enlarging this spatial framework beyond the Atlantic to the globe. The global dimensions of colonial America existed long before Plymouth. In a book published as long ago as 1969, uh, Rudolf Robert insisted that as early modern English people ventured both eastward and westward around the globe, they drew on experiences from both directions. So investors and settlers alike built the Virginia colony, for example, on global fantasies. They imagined it as a trading venture that was comparable to those in the east, in Asia and the Mediterranean. The Virginia colonist William Strachey compared trade with the American Indians to trade with Turkey and the East Indies. Lewis Morgan, who was the first minister on Providence Island, and that was an English Puritan colony off the coast of what is now Nicaragua, imagined growing 
cloves, pepper, nutmeg, and mace. He was explicitly promoting the colony as an alternative to East Indian commerce. Another Puritan, Robert Hunt, modeled the Madagascar colony of Asada explicitly on the example of Barbados, uh, where he had earlier uh, lived, but he also compared Asada to English Virginia, Portuguese Goa, and Dutch Batavia. English Atlantic plantations everywhere were actively imagined within a global world of transoceanic trade. Now tellingly, Robert's book is a history neither of early America nor of English colonialism, but of the chartered company. The English colonies of Plymouth, Virginia, and Providence Island that I've just mentioned were all companies, as were Massachusetts Bay, Dorchester, Bermuda, and more. North American colonialism shared these corporate foundations with English efforts around the world. Recently, historians have begun to dismantle the long-standing bifurcation between the Atlantic and Indian Ocean worlds by recognizing that those geographical divisions have been reified by narrative plots. A story of English colonialism in the Atlantic world has been falsely separated from a story of English trade in the Indian and Pacific worlds. That separation has obscured, as the historian Alison Games argues, it's obscured the circular connections between trade and settlement that would allow us to see the English project of the Atlantic plantation colony in the context of the global and transoceanic trading world that produced it. So Games constructs out of this uh, global context an alternative narrative and she populates it with a diverse group of 17th century English cosmopolitans uh, whose exposure to travel narratives, investment opportunities, and imported uh, commodities encouraged a thirst for long distance travel and for private enterprise. But this new story too has a plot organized around a kind of celebratory cosmopolitanism that still obscures the role of colonial corporations. A Philip J. Stern's book, The Company State, also challenges this hemispheric dichotomy between Asia and America, but in a different way, by focusing precisely on the early modern commercial company, which he argues actually recast the borders of the Atlantic and Asia in the first place. For Stern, the 17th century was characterized by a political mixture of what he describes as empire, globalization, hybridity, and fragmentation that was carried out through a variety of overlapping corporate forms, including an East India company that operated as a company state, which resembled a body politic as much as it did a commercial business. Only later were these myriad early modern corporate forms absorbed by an upstart and rival form of corporation, the nation state which has since, Stern argues, so thoroughly dominated our imaginations that it has made it impossible for us to even recognize these earlier uh, precedents. So Stern's model calls for a narrative of the period that's animated less by specific regions, or even for that matter, by specific religious or linguistic traditions, than by this hybrid multi-corporatism of the early modern globe that includes commercial companies. Such a framework quickly reveals not only that English colonists in America arrived largely under the auspices of companies, but they were also really relative latecomers to what had already been by the early part of the 1600s, a century long effort at English overseas expansion. Uh, England had of course earlier sought to compete with Spain in such global pursuits. But English expansion efforts were much more immediately driven by a crisis in the cloth trade, which inspired aggressive searches for new export markets around the world 
The resulting overseas ventures were made possible by the innovative financing model of the chartered joint stock company. Unlike the Spanish model of empire building that relied on a central powerful crown, joint stock companies were made up of private investors with royal monopolies that made it possible to finance expensive and risky overseas ventures from India to America. The first joint stock chartered company in England was the Russia or Muscovy Company that was created in 1553 to fund an expedition to reach the east through a supposed Northwest passage. The company collectivized financial risk. They spread it out among a group of merchants who were hoping for returns on their investment. The voyage failed miserably, uh, but it's few, a few survivors did actually successfully establish trade relations with the Russians uh, because they landed on, found themselves stranded on their Northern coast. And then the model which financed that trip subsequently flourished as a way to facilitate English commercial expansion around the world throughout the 16th and 17th centuries. In 1585, joint stock companies under Queen Elizabeth underwrote not just colonies, but privateering expeditions in the world's oceans, where English ships sought to intercept and steal the wealth of rival empires, especially Catholic ones, carrying profitable goods across the world's oceans. That little detail actually takes us back to 1619 because that's exactly how those enslaved Africans ended up off the coast of the colony of Virginia. The English ship that carried them was on a privateering expedition in the Atlantic. That ship named the White Lion stole enslaved people held as cargo on a Portuguese slave ship that was headed to Mexico from the coast of what is now the African country of Angola. That English privateering ship, the White Lion, was owned by Robert Rich, better known as the Earl of Warwick. Warwick was an English nobleman, a Puritan and a wealthy London investor. He had governing roles in all three of the companies that funded Atlantic Puritan colonies, the Bermuda Company, the Providence Island Company, and the New England Company. He sat also on the Council of New England, the body that backed the Popham colony in Maine. And uh, Mary Mount's Thomas Morton it actually emerges from the really complicated history of that enterprise. That's a history we easily miss if we only read the excerpts rather than the entirety of William Bradford's diary. It was Warwick who combined the land grant from the defunct New England Company with the assets of another previously failed colonial project called the Dorchester Company. Warwick later would become governor of the Bermuda Company. He coordinated relations between it, the Providence Island Company, and the Massachusetts Bay Company. He invested in all of these companies while simultaneously holding stock in the East India Company. He was also a patron of the Puritan minister, Thomas Hooker, who established the colony of Connecticut. So Warwick's fingerprints are all over the English colonial project in the Atlantic world, but they're also in the Indian and Pacific Ocean worlds. Warwick's investment in and leadership in multiple joint stock companies at once was common practice. So take the example of Sir Thomas Smythe, another wealthy English nobleman and investor. He was governor of the Muscovy Company, governor of the Levant Company, governor of the East India Company, and treasurer of the Virginia Company. He invested also in the French Company, the Northwest Passage Company, and the Bermuda Company. The Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Ocean worlds come together in the early modern portfolios of men like Warwick and Smythe, neither of whom ever left England. And these joint stock ventures were triggered, as I suggested earlier, by the cloth trade crisis in England, which also led to the diaspora of workers from England's textile industry, including 
the many Puritans who migrated later from Holland to North America, among whom were the well-known Leiden group of pilgrims that emigrated as part of the Plymouth Company. Because the narrative plot about Plymouth settlers is conventionally constructed around their pursuit of religious freedom, Plymouth status as a joint stock company and the pressures and motivations associated with that status are obscured, as is the global labor history of its colonists. Calcified geographic divisions produce stories that prevent us from seeing the global connections that inform these projects their participants and their writing. Centering the corporation places colonial America in a global spatial framework that's crisscrossed by these relations of trade and investment rather than a national temporal framework that's linear and retro determined. And once we put that small colonial settlement of Plymouth in this global perspective, it not only becomes possible to see a relationship we never might have seen between 1619 and 1620. But it's also easier to see what gets hidden by that linear national narrative. Andrew Fitzmaurice has argued that because historians have focused on the colony to the neglect of the company, they've missed the corporate alignments of ministers who very often delivered company propaganda along with the spiritual content of their sermons. And he uses the examples of the Virginia, Newfoundland, Plymouth, and Bermuda companies to show that ministers routinely served as company propagandists. They were like early modern public relations managers for the corporations that underwrote colonial settlement schemes in which they participated. Our dominant narratives have installed John Winthrop's hyper canonical lay sermon, a model of Christian charity, as a proto national vision of American exceptionalism that has bolstered the campaigns and policies of presidents from Kennedy to Nixon and Reagan. But Scott Michelson has helped us to see that, sir, see that sermon as a promotional effort on behalf of the Massachusetts Bay Company to spiritualize inequality. Michelson points out that Winthrop's audience for the sermon included on the one hand, the larger community bound for Boston that was made up of rich and poor. And on the other hand, a smaller group of wealthy company investors back in London concerned about returns. Winthrop's own rhetorical collapse of these two distinct groups into a single one has been replicated, uh, Michelson argues, by historians and literary critics ever since. So focus on companies encourages a more global orientation to early American literary and cultural history that in turn reveals lateral connections between multiple colonial stories. But the example of several recent volumes on the role of merchant companies in early American history has made it clear to me that such a shift cannot alone dislodge the danger of the linear story that I described at the outset of this talk. New World Inc, The Making of America by England's Merchant Adventurers, uh, written by business journalists, John Butman and Simon Target, published in 2018, argues that Plymouth and its pilgrims were falsely installed as the origin story about America. They say that story has to begin instead in 1552 with the collapse in the English cloth trade. Now, I should stop to say that I actually applaud this book for its timeline of American literary and cultural history. I think it adds significant global complexity and historical depth to the story of North American English colonialism. But I really roundly reject the implotment that structures this expanded timeline. Uh, and it creates a central heroic protagonist in that guy we were introduced to before Thomas Smythe, that powerful and wealthy London merchant, who much like the Earl of Warwick, boasted multiple company investments and leadership roles. Most importantly for Butman and Target, however, Smythe continued unrelentingly to pour material resources into the financial disaster that was the Virginia Company. 
In doing so, they maintain, he saved England's hitherto disastrous investments in the North American colonial project. Bubbin and Target basically replaced the religious city on a hill with its economic equivalent of the offshore, offshore startup insisting that America's origins lie in the heroism of business entrepreneurs. Those early modern investors, writers, and promoters like Smythe, who were the equivalents of today's venture capitalists, startup entrepreneurs, and tech gurus, because they organized, promoted, and supported hundreds of ventures, one after another, until multiple threads of failure began to stitch into a fabric of success. They're not the first to renew a tired American exceptionalist plot from a business angle. Four years before New World Inc., an article in Business Insider magazine appeared titled America the Startup, How European Settlers Launched the Most Entrepreneurial Economy in the World. As a literary scholar committed to close reading, I'm just, you have to indulge me um, while I pause for a moment to point out the narratological features embedded here. So note how the geographical diction, the words America, European and world, substitute for, but also accumulate on top of each other, quietly populating America with Europeans and thus aligning America with whiteness before establishing the result as world dominating. This geographical diction alternates with Silicon Valley business diction, startup launch entrepreneurial economy, importing into the era of early modern colonialism, the language of 21st century capitalism. The word startup in the shorter main title transforms the patriotic phrase America, the beautiful into something more like America, the profitable. Meanwhile, the longer subtitle linearizes a story of progress from struggle to success, rags to riches, startup to billionaire, while that superlative term most caps the whole construct with ongoing superpower status. The visual image that accompanies this title in the online publication is a Mayflower-esque sailing vessel soaring atop the registered national brand name, America, while the beta superscript renders colonial settlers an early testing version of a nation that would be released later. New World Inc., whose book cover seems to kind of frankly steal the article's graphics, actually builds a longer, deeper, and even more triumphalist version of the magazine story. They praise investors for Smythe for continuing to fund these ventures until they succeed, describing that behavior as, quote, the quality that Americans have come to regard as quintessentially their own perseverance. In many ways, we're all trained to embrace perseverance as a virtue, but I wanna explore what that word really means here, how it works. It cloaks beneath a veneer of individualized determination, the exploitation and coercion carried out in the name of companies and often sponsored by the state. One good example of this narrative practice appears in Butman and Target's early telling of the story of Robert Kett. So Kett led a rebellion in England in 1539 against the privatization of land through fencing enclosures, protesting rising inequality. Um, protesting what the writers describe as the avarice of the 2% who governed the 98%. Kett's rebellion was finally quashed by John Dudley, who publicly executed and dismembered its participants. Butman and Target explain that his, Dudley had little choice because Kett refused to surrender. Dudley had little choice they say, but to murder and dismember the rebels. The unstated implication in that sentence is that one way or another, the rebellion had to be suppressed. Why? Because the whole plot of their story, which they present as the story of America, depends on the inequality and privatization that Kett 
and his allies were protesting. The only reason the Ket Rebellion appears in New World Inc. at all is to introduce Dudley, who's cast as the mastermind of the group of London men who plot England's escape from economic disaster in the wake of the cloth trade crisis. Dudley's the beta version of Smythe. It's Dudley who recruits Sebastian Cabot to lead a quest to reach Asia in a venture organized through the mechanisms of a joint stock company. Butman and Target's book make it clear that one cannot tell the story of early America without talking about companies, which means that the story of early America has to include the world, but they continually bury the fact that one also cannot tell the story of early America without telling the story of violence. In her award-winning history, New England Bound, Slavery and Colonization in Early America, Wendy Warren identifies 1638 as the moment when the first known slaving voyage to and from New England took place. It was the year the first enslaved Africans arrived from the West Indies to New England. It was also the, the year that the first enslaved Native Americans were shipped from New England to the West Indies. Warren goes on to observe that in 1638, quote, only eight years after the founding of the famed Massachusetts Bay Colony, less than two decades after the celebrated pilgrims founded the equally mythologized Plymouth Colony, an enslaved African woman on an island in Boston's harbor was anguished because another slave had raped her upon their mutual owner's orders so that he might own a breed of Negroes, end quote. Warren's sentence sets the traditional 1620 origin story with its famed, celebrated, and mythologized features against a 1638 story about the enslaved, the anguished, and the raped. Her book, which unearths the long overlooked history of slavery in colonial New England, also unearths the often brutal violence which the traditional implotment of the 1776 story prevents us from seeing. In her recent book, Invisible Masters, Gender, Race, and the Economy of Service in Early New England, Elizabeth Cheppy gives us a way to rethink the Weberian alliance between Puritanism and capitalism by recognizing the critical role played by racial slavery. Chepi shows that the virtues of industry and frugality that were associated by Weber with capitalist spirit were actually forged in the master-servant lived metaphors of vocation. She demonstrates that the act of self-service, which was seen by Puritans as a disdainful vice, got transformed into the practice of self-mastery, which is associated with admirable virtues of independence, resiliency, self-reliance. That transformation happened pre precisely through the crucible of race, which distinguished white servants from black slaves. The spirit of capitalism is not just the spirit of self-mastery then, but the spirit of white mastery over non-white others. And what we really mean by spirit here is therefore also something closer to violence and oppression. When we pair Chepi's literary analysis of New England theological discourse with Warren's social history of New England slavery, we get a narrative about colonial New England that's embedded within much larger, a much larger global context riven by racial inequality and exploitative violence. It conjoins 1619 with 1620 with 1638 in a narrative that's more lateral than linear. In the book I mentioned much earlier uh, by Alison Games on early modern English cosmopolitanism, she argues that forceful imperial violence only began to dominate England's global efforts with Cromwell's Western design when she says a newly centralized state capable of imposing its will on subjects well outside of its domestic borders and thus well on its way to becoming an empire began to take shape. 
it may be the case that the centralized state arrived later, but the coercion was always there. Uh, going back to Stern's argument about the company state, we can see joint stock companies as a mechanism that delivered such coercion in global colonial contexts that were fraught with danger and risk. Joint stock companies were alliances between private funds and state interests that outsourced military might by putting these ventures into the hands of private investors like Smythe and Warwick, a practice that kept these ventures as a, at a distance from the crown while still serving its, its goals. Uh, I've described these companies um, in Transoceanic America as one of the battering rams of war capitalism, a term developed by Sven Beckert in his Global History of Cotton. Uh, and he develops this term because he says it better communicates the rawness and violence of pre 19th century industrial capitalism than the traditional term mercantile capitalism. <clears throat> Beckert argues that war capitalism began to develop in the 16th century as a way of extracting land and labor from distant locations around the globe. And it lasted in some cases well into the 19th century. For Beckert, only a global history of capitalism effectively illustrates the centrality of violence to the profitable collaboration between the state and private enterprise throughout this phase. This framework of global war capitalism helps us to see that the joint stock company partnered with settler colonialism in North America from the very beginning. And it did so by pairing existing mechanisms of joint stock investment with an institutionalization of violent tactics in order to reduce the continued financial risks and losses associated with the former. This is the table that holds up the fish floating and feeding in its bowl. And this is the dynamic that we're prevented from seeing by celebrating perseverance and spirit as forms of American exceptionalism. But when this table gets tethered to 1776 in a linear story of national triumph, it gets surprisingly easy to overlook these coercive and exploitative features of corporations. The first chapter of legal scholar Adam Winkler's book, We the Corporations, is titled, In the Beginning, America Was a Corporation. Winkler nominates the Virginia Company, the Massachusetts Bay Company, and the East India Company as this trio of corporate founding fathers whose influence reaches from the colonial period to the revolution and the constitution. Winkler associates Virginia Company investors who included such men as Francis Bacon and Thomas Hobbes along with men like Warwick and Smythe with a willingness to take risks like today's venture capitalists. Winkler makes Thomas West the hero of his narrative, much as Butman and Target make Smythe the hero of theirs. And for the same reason, for being rich men willing to pour even more of their considerable wealth into disastrous colonial projects in an effort to recoup their deep investments. This narrative dematerializes and disembodies risk by financializing it. It's important to remember that those investors were not the settlers. The passengers on the ships that landed in what we now call Virginia in 1607 were mostly servants who were under the direction of the company and the council in London, just as Plymouth's colonists were subjected to the decisions and directions of London investors and governors. The troubling relationship between those who risked their money and those who risked their bodies is in some ways the actual subject of Bradford's book of Plymouth Plantation. Winkler sees some of this, but um, he confesses that, quote, the corporation that brought democracy and thanksgiving to America also brought more nefarious practices, including human trafficking, even before the first African slaves arrived, end quote. Winkler's referring to the fund established by the Virginia Company to pay for the shipment of women to the colony. Bernard Balin describes these women as largely 
unmarried orphans in their early 20s or late teens who were either servants or unemployed and who were adrift in a patriarchal world. When these women arrived in Virginia in 1620 and 1621, they were sold to the highest bidders in an effort to ensure the financial success of the colony by encouraging its men to stay and to labor. These women, their arrival on a ship actually followed a series of earlier shipments of children sent to be a source of labor. In 1619, the same year that Warwick's ship, the White Lion, arrived with stolen enslaved people from Angola, 99 children between the ages of eight and 16 arrived on another ship to Jamestown. These children were recruited from the city of London's vagrant population in response to a petition that came from the governing body of the Virginia Company. And many more petitions and many more ships followed. So despite such egregious acts of violence committed to help ensure a profit that never actually materialized, Winkler gives the Virginia Company credit for developing an assembly model for governance that he sees as the origin of American democracy. He says, it was a corporation after all that planted the first seeds of democracy in the colonies. And the goal was to secure profit, not promote liberty, end quote. Winkler is not wrong to say that European America was incorporated from its very beginning. The settler nation of the United States is in this sense unthinkable without companies. But we have to be careful about how or if we draw a narrative line between those companies through 1776 to today. The danger of a linear story, especially linear stories about the nation, that it leaves out the tragic in service of the triumphalist. It constructs a triumphant narrative plot whose celebratory outcomes, such as democracy, freedom, and nation, retroactively hide or at least cleanse the acts of violent conflict that help bring those supposed outcomes into being. By eliminating from view that retroactive curve and the cycles of violence within it, we flatten the rotational dynamics of revolution into a line. And that flattening in turn conveniently encourages us to lose sight of the cruelty and destruction within American cultural history. I'm gonna wrap up now. I think we can all safely say that the decade of the 2020s is off to a rough start. Whatever effect the 1619 project may have had on quatrocentennials commemorations of 1620, history had its own plan for hijacking 2020. Uh, but one way to measure the effectiveness of the 1619 project is by the force and volume of resistance to it. Of all the 2020 responses to it, the most insidious is surely uh, Donald Trump's 1776 commission, an attempt to mandate a celebratory freedom plot for the teaching of American history. Close behind that, however, is the self-titled 1620 project. This is a conservative response to the 1619 project that rejects the latter centering of slavery to reassert the centrality of freedom, which in the context of this initiative is really another word for uh, whiteness and for capitalism. It's no surprise that the organization that hosts the 1620 project, this vaguely titled National Association of Scholars, also endorsed Trump's 1776 commission. Uh, this National Association of Scholars is headed up by Peter Wood, a uh, former Boston University uh, faculty member who has rejected the concepts of both climate change and structural racism, and whose two published books were put out by Encounter Press, which is bankrolled by the right-wing Bradley Foundation. He's also associated with the Heartland Institute, a free market think tank that's also funded in part by the Bradley Foundation, by the Koch brothers, and by a long list of corporations. Most of me is, is loath to give this website or its leader uh, any attention, um, but I also think it's critical to see the role being played by corporations today in bankrolling a story, an implotment of American history 
that simultaneously uh, free market and white supremacist. The dehumanization of women, of Africans, of poor people, of indigenous people at the hands of corporations whose claim to the status and rights of human people has a long legal history, which uh, Winkler's book uh, unfolds, and it's been most recently consolidated in the Citizens United Supreme Court case. So I'll end instead with a slide from the 1619 project and suggest that perhaps in 2021, we can find ways to reconfigure the past whether we start in 1620, 1619, 1638, or 1522, in more honest ways to help us better understand where and who we are now. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That was incredible. Uh, there's so much in that. There's so much, and I'm gonna annoy people by taking up the next two hours. But I'm not. I'm going to go to the Q&A first because we have to hear from our floor. Um, um, so let me see if we've got any questions coming in. Okay, so Miroslav has said, despite increasingly more dislike towards such ideas as trickle-down economics, as best illustrated by President Biden's State of the Union address two days ago, the tragedy of greed, as you called it, still is very much visible. How can the US change this when some Americans, particularly libertarians, strongly hold on to the myths of freedom that take root in the colonial era, and which often refers ideology, uh, often refers to ide ideology of the American revolutionary as illustrated by the use of the Gadsden flag? Do you think that Americans are ready to abandon the specific and peculiar ideals of individualism, rugged but not only, that continue to be omnipresent in American culture and thought? Yes, I, um, my description of that <clears throat> narrative band as being made out of some kind of industrial strength elastic uh, is exactly a recognition of just how deeply and fiercely and tightly held uh, that particular fantasy is. And in some ways, <clears throat> what I'm trying to uh, surface and grapple with uh, in this talk is how to counteract it. Um, and my attempt has been here to right, sort of come at it from the direction of plot uh, rather than right, sort of theme or, or protagonist so that <clears throat> we, we might, I don't, I guess my, my answer to the, the question really is that I don't know if people are willing to let go of it. I, for me, the, the question, the better question might be how we can encourage everyone to see it from a different perspective that results in the letting go of it. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise I think we're just, caught in a binary battle between freedom and slavery and 1619 and 1620 um, that isn't necessarily very uh, productive. Um, surfacing, right, the Earl of Warwick and his, his, the links between 1619 and the arrival of those uh, enslaved Africans and 1620 and the, the pilgrims and the Puritans was for me a way to try to just cut across that division in a way, right? Um, really what the, what the narrative is, is like freedom and slavery, two sides of this one story. And I think we need to just find a way of not just turning it one way or the other and fighting about which side we're gonna look at, mm -hmm. but just rip it open this way somehow, right? Um, so that, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm grappling with. Okay, cool. Um, I shall move through some of these. Larissa, who is over in Russia. Hi, Larissa, haven't seen you in ages. Um, could you please comment on the recent TV series, Jamestown, in the light of your approach? 
I would love to, except that I haven't seen the recent series, Jamestown. So uh, somebody else is going to have to do that for me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let me see. Agnieszka, thank you for a brilliant lecture. What is your assessment of Jill Lepore's very popular These Truths? Which origin story or stories does it tell? Um, yeah, that is a good question. And I have read a few uh, reviews and commentaries on Lepore's book without having uh, read that entire book myself. Um, you know, this is, this is actually one of those moments, um, Philip, where Zoom, <laughs> the Zoom <laughs> format is not, is not helping out the uh, the dialogism of the, the Q&A, because I would love to uh, ask these, these two last folks to right, kind of share more um, uh, from their own perspective, which would really, I think, help us have a, have a conversation about them. But what, what those two questions are, are highlighting, uh, it seems to me, is just how many cultural productions are circulating currently in our present moment uh, around these, these, these questions of, of implotment and how we understand American cultural history, uh, how we talk about the story of, our, of the past uh, and its connection to the present. And again, I'll just emphasize that Though every time we turn that into a linear story, there's something very uh, attractive and appealing about it, but also something very dangerous about it. Mm -hmm. And if we can build uh, the sort of critical muscles to become wary of that linear linearization, I think we will be better off. Okay, thank you. I see that uh, Begonna, maybe the last chapter in season one of the TV series, Jamestown focuses on that pivotal moment, the arrival of the first slaves. This would confirm your 1620 hypothesis. So, you know, I'm really interested in how those, how our contemporary corporations, whether it's Netflix or Apple or Amazon, uh, and what their motivations, you know, can, we always know what their motivations are, but who's telling that kind of story now? Who's going back to those moments? And what is it that they are kind of delivering to their streaming, downloading audience? So anyway, um, yeah, yeah, I think that that's a, a important and interesting question to be asking, especially because you turn those on and you're presented with some options that you think are, right, there's, there's some algorithm somewhere determining what we think is in the archive at this point. Um, they're sort of re replacing uh, libraries in, in some ways. So it's not just through their programming, but it's through what they present as available to us as narratives uh, that, that become a problem. Yeah. No, that's true. We could talk about that for ages, but there's a lot of questions coming in. So I'm going to go to Gordon. Um, Gordon has a question about what he sees as the unspoken background of your really extraordinary talk. We share a belief in the fundamental dignity and equality of all human beings because they are human beings. And yet this is not an entirely conceivable idea in the early modern era. My concern with all of the dates here, 1619, 1620, 1776, is that none give us an adequate origin story to our belief in the fundamental dignity of all people. Are sure. these then the best way of approaching this question? Quite possibly not, um, right? Because uh, they, they do limit our perspective by putting us in one particular scenario um, at one particular point in time. Um, I ended by trying to multiply the dates and suggest that we look at the way the dates might be connected with each other and, and kind of tried to pull some colonial dates together so that um, we're, we're not necessarily trying to, to draw um, lines between the past and the future. But I like very much the idea of thinking beyond dates. Um, Although we, the alternatives to them may land us ultimately 
with the same problem, right? We could replace a, a date with a location. Um, we could uh, perhaps replace the date with a, with a story, um, but it's about the implotment. It's about the connections between the dates and between the places and between the stories uh, where we begin to build these tight bands that, that, uh, that are limiting. Yeah, and, I, and I'm like, I was really fascinated listening to your talk and thinking about that sort of non-linear aspect and, and more about the sense of circulation uh, okay. that these kind of commercial enterprises would be, would be interested in. I see Carmen has asked a question. Would you say that Baharati Mukherjee, uh, with her novel, The Holders of the World, as early as 1993, already predicted the economic perspective of early America? since she also focuses on the East India Company to show that there was more than just Puritans and slavery in early America? Uh, I, I, again, I don't know if I would necessarily say that particular book um, may, makes that kind of prediction, but uh, books like that, that are unearthing that history um, and those archives, I think are incredibly important. And if we think about, right, sort of more recent books like that, we can actually, you know, potentially construct different kinds of uh, literary histories that would then populate earlier periods very, very differently. So, um, I kind of like the, the idea of establishing right, sort of multiple, um, one of the problems as, as far as right, sort of um, teaching American literary history is that we're, we're trapped in our anthologies sometimes. And, and the anthologies really, really over time, just increasingly, I see them as having barely changed. And there are also just barely, there really are barely alternatives to them. Um, and sometimes I feel as if we should just abandon the entire genre of the anthology and just go into a sort of a mode of uh, archival exploration, um, which you could do with a book like that, right? Start with it. What kind of a literary history would you create if you started with that particular novel? What else would you populate it with? Um, uh, but also, we really just need some radically alternative um, literary histories to take an anthology form. Yeah, no, I, I, I was really intrigued by the information data coming from the anthologies that you had earlier. But I will go back to the questions that are still coming in on the screen. Uh, Ilka, thank you for an insightful presentation. You did touch upon the relationship between companies and religion. Would you, let's just jumped, would you say that companies co-opted early American religion or do you think that Protestant Christianity already lent itself to or catered to or itself followed corporate interest? That's a big question. <laughs> it's a massive question. That's a, that's a great question that um, I'm finding myself having to muse on in the moment here. And I'm inclined to say um, that religion and business, the relationship between them may really be similar to that intertwining of freedom and slavery uh, that I was describing earlier. And it may be less of a dichotomy that we have to right, sort of then choose one over the other. Uh, there's, a, there's a pretty recent book um, by the historian, the historian Bethany Morton um, on uh, the history of Walmart and the relationship between uh, corporations and uh, religion. So this, it seems to me, is another 
really long, deep, complicated um, story uh, that that could be turned into a longer narrative. But I would, it, I just think it's really difficult to completely separate them. I think they they are kind of sewn into each other mm -hmm. uh, in in a, in a way. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely be thinking that it's a bit like sort of trying to keep the water in the fishbowl without the fishbowl being there. It's like, well, <laughs> how are we going to do this? Right, right, yeah. Uh, Douglas Green, this has been such an illuminating, an illum illuminating talk. Sorry, I'm wondering if you've seen any of this battle against a single employment in current fiction, and if so, where? Um, we have bark skins and overstories seem to move in directions you're driving at. Um, you mentioned the title overstory. What was the previous one? Bark skins. Bark skins. I, I don't know that one, but I do know overstory. Um, I'm very interested in that question and in that possibility. Um, and in, in my recent book, Transoceanic America, I really talk about uh, narrative um, and global capitalism as being intertwined also with the novel, um, with the emergence of the novel and ways of, of storytelling that emerge in the kind of 18th century. And I have found myself wondering whether we're at a, a point in literary, in the history of literary development where the novel itself is beginning to sort of transform. Um, I've been noticing a lot of, of books that are called novels, but are actually memoirs, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, with the internet, we have the potential for modes of narrative storytelling that actually really are quite more lateral um, than, than linear. Uh, so I, I think that may be possible, but I don't feel able to necessarily point to particular titles or, or writers where, where I see this happening, but I suspect it may be something that's happening. Yeah, Douglas has come back and said, Bark Skins is by uh, Annie Prill. Companies play a central role. I think you'd find it fascinating. I'm gonna I have a really good reading and watching list developing from this Q&A. So thank you, thank you everybody. I will add that one to it. Uh, Philip Schweikhauser, uh, splendid talk, many thanks. One of your previous books was entitled Folded Selves, Colonial American Writing in the World System. Does world systems theory, a la Wallerstein or Wallerstein, play a role in your most recent book as well? Uh, yes, but less so um, than it did in that particular book. And I found myself um, working more so with the uh, Sven Beckert um, global history of cotton and the whole concept of war capitalism. Wallerstein actually uses mercantile capitalism and I found that war capitalism was a very transformative way for me to, to think about um, the colonial period that, that I work in. So that, that was a change. Okay, cool. Uh, Karsten Juncker, um, thank you for this intriguing reformulation of a genealogy of beginnings. What texts and material would you like to see included in an expanded literary archive to support this multi, multiple sided employment? <laughs> How long have we got? That is, um, uh, my, my actual answer to that question is that what I would like to see happen in classrooms uh, as we teach American literary history and as we begin in these earlier periods is again, with the availability of archives digitally uh, to be shared and to be accessed. What I would like to see is students being invited into those archives to find materials and texts 
and writers and moments and dates that we have forgotten about. Um, and to just begin this, this sort of uh, exploration and unearthing um, of those materials. Um, that, that's what I would like to see. And then, right, where, where might those kinds of discoveries lead them? Where might they lead us? Uh, backwards, forwards, sideways, um, in inquiry, uh, rather than in a line. Um, more questions, I'm afraid. Larissa, who was on earlier about Jamestown. Reading primary sources and news is definitely one of the ways to reach a less skewed view. While digitizing Richard Hakluyt's book on English sea travels of the 17th century and on the transfer from Portugal to England, domination in the seas, I find a lot of observational gems to share with students. That's great. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And again, I think this is partly why I'm involved with the um, the series at Lever Press. Um, I, I think that creating um, digitally open access editions of these earlier works, which, you know, it's hard sometimes to make a case with conventional print publishers to, to take a chance on them, especially if they aren't already an established text that's regularly uh, taught. So uh, if I could kind of just co-op the mo this this moment for a second to right, invite anybody who um, right, uh, has such a text that, that they think is, is worth making available uh, to, to students and readers um, to uh, be in contact with me. Um, it's great yeah. to hear about that happening. Yeah, I, I, you know, I would love for that kind of availability, digital or otherwise, particularly digital, to be kind of commonplace. Um, I, do, I know that some institutions and libraries don't necessarily have the funding for all of that kind of work. It would be, I think it would be great to rethink and recover an American cultural history through those original texts if it was possible. And our, I think students love that kind of work, but that's maybe a conversation for the day. Uh, Miroslava, thank you so much for mentioning the issue of scholars' responsibility. Who can or is ready to counterbalance the activities of academicians, academics like Peter Wood and institutions like the NAS? Uh, we are, that's our responsibility. Um, and uh, we need to take it on, I think. Um, you know, in the, the, there's a really weird use of the word scholars and scholarly in some of this material that I was noticing, um, you know, the title, I'm not gonna pull it up again, I don't have it in front of me, but the title of the 1776 commission was something, you know, has the word scholars in it. Um, and that National Association of Scholars, um, there, right, this is a battle over language. It's a battle over words. Um, and, and what they mean and how they're being used as much as it is a battle over uh, plot and, and implotment. And I think it's important to call, there's a, there's a tendency I think to make fun of um, you know, some of this stuff and to laugh it off uh, and also to not really give it too much attention, um, which I sympathize with on the one hand, but um, once you really begin to pursue uh, information about who these people are and especially about who is funding them and who's funding these initiatives and underwriting them. I mean, really we're back in the same right, uh, question about, about corporations and, and, and narrative. Um, I think it, it needs to be called out. Yeah, I think you know, who's funding the uh, Arizona uh, recount <laughs> the web ninjas like uh, uh, crazy um cecile hein has quite a long comment here so thank you for this fantastic talk throughout your talk i kept being reminded of tiffany lethabo king's the black shoals which elaborates on the shoal as physical maritime and theoretical space 
bring together black and indigenous conversations on settler colonialism and slowing down as shoals have slowed down slave ships and trade voyages and to complicate settler narratives. I thus wonder how attention to the environment and its dominating cycles inform and or complicate the retelling of historical and theoretical narratives. There's more to it, but I'll, let, I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I thank you for that question and really for, for that comment. Um, I love that idea of the shoals and as uh, Philip, you were reading it and, and describing it, um, it occurred to me that maybe that's an alternative to a date, right? Uh, for uh, at a kind of e ecological uh, formation like that. Yeah. Um, I wasn't able to include it in my talk, but at the very end of my, um, of, of my book, Transition at America, I take a diagram from, um, from another book, right? Sort of uh, outlining how narratives of, you know, novels or literary history are constructed. And it's a diagram that, that shows a coastline and then with islands off of it and shows how, right, the story of the novel, for instance, goes from these early islands out in the, the water, uh, you know, Defoe, um, uh, Richardson, uh, before we land on like the continent of the novel. And similarly, right, you can think about colonial American texts as being these islands out in the ocean that lead us to this continent of uh, American literature. But the brilliance of the diagram is to uh, suggest that if you go under the water, um, those islands in many cases are not connected to the mainland at all, but to some other uh, shelf uh, in, in, a, in another location. And so the whole idea, honestly, of diving below the waterline, uh, which is really what I'm talking about when I talk about doing the kind of archival exploration, just get off of the surface where we're being prevented from seeing all of this ultimately right kind of discarded uh, literary history that has been thrown off the ship because it was not seen as connecting up right or uh, having the right aesthetic features or whatever. Let's just dive in the water and begin to bring things up. So. Um, uh, in that sense, I think right, that that's more of a uh, ecological, um, geographical, maritime metaphor more than anything else. But I do think um, it's critically important not to forget the environmental dimension to everything that was in, included um, in, in the story that I told earlier um, that I did not pay that much attention to, but the environmental impact of all of this, of course, this colonial um, corporate history is just profound, continues to be, of course. Yeah. Um, Cecile does have a little bit more in that comment. So <laughs> additionally, and somewhat more provocatively, does this centering of the company as leading organization of early U.S. settler history, not refocus white settler and to a certain extent reiterate a privileging the white U.S. subject. I think that your research is really fantastic and necessary. I only wonder how methodologically speaking to avoid re-centering white history over black, indigenous and other non-white people's history. Yes. Um... That's, it's, a, it's a valid concern. Um, and every time we, I mean, this, this is Michelle Wright's argument in the, the piece that I, that I cited in the beginning. Every time you tell a single origin story, um, you are stopping yourself from seeing all kinds of other stories. Uh, so that was kind of why I was trying to resist presenting just another origin story and encouraging right, a kind of lateralism mm -hmm. to the way we explore narrative construction. 
Um, yes, I, I agree that it would it would be, and we've seen all kinds of examples, right? The New World Inc. The there's all kinds of ways of centering the company that are awful. Um, uh, so there are many right, sort of dimensions to how we we put these things, um, we put these stories, these narratives together. And there's a lot to resist and a lot to continue to remind ourselves about, um, I think, as we embark on them. So I suppose I, I submit the corporation as a focus to help us see some of the things we haven't been able to see in the other stories, but I don't submit it as the only alternative um, or to take the place of the 1619 project, which I think is really, really important and powerful. I couldn't help thinking while I was listening to you in your talk and also in the answers you've just been giving, Michelle, um, of Elizabeth Bishop's poem, Crusoe in England, uh, in which uh, she repositions Crusoe back in England after he's been rescued from his island and how the, the island and the construction of the kind of archipelago of different influences and the volcanoes and uh, of his memories and that sort of confluence of different trades and uh, commercial interests that he has with him, how that kind of mapped on to part of what you were doing in this, uh, you know, where your, your, your discourse about these companies is kind of within this fluid motion of commerce and commercialism in in this period, and it, it, it's it was an it's an intriguing area of like how long have you been? And what I also want to know is how long has this taken to get to this point? Because there's so much detail in this within that sort of massive ocean of interests. How long has it taken? Um. Well, I you, Everything builds on everything that came before in a way, right? I guess it's taken, that. my answer is going to be the whole time. It's, it's taken the whole time. Um, uh, you know, each of my, honestly, each of my books have been really quite different from the thing that came before it. Um, but the, the, the interests and the questions um, and the commitments that connect them are are less on the surface, I think. Um, and they are about uh, the construction of American literary history. And they are about the recovery of, of um, texts and traditions and, and voices. Um, and so even though I may change, uh, I focus on a particular historical period or theoretical framework or genre, um, those are the things that are really tying it all together. Um, and I guess just the only other thing to add is just that, just try to follow the, the story. Um, and it takes me in all these strange places. Um, you know, just, just for this talk, I ended up on that, the site for this 1776 commission and the 1620 project. And then I thought, who is this guy? And, you know, and I found out who he is and I'm like, who's that? What's that foundation? And then, right? So, and none of that's linear. It's all lateral. It's all kind of diving under the surface of the waterline, but right. that's where I all the connections are. I'm gonna ask one last thing and then I'm gonna let us applaud your brilliance. But that is the image from the Business Insider magazine uh, about the Europeans and the entrepreneurs and stuff, it was interesting that the flag on the ship was the English flag. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of interesting. <laughs> it just it stands, maybe I'm because I'm Irish, it stands out. But it's like, that's interesting why they would put that flag and not any other flag on this. And, and I wondered, you know, the whole Anglo-Saxon political culture thing that uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is spouting these days. And I just wondered whether there was some sort of subliminal messaging going on there with that flag and, and quite where that might be going. But that was just a sort of sidebar. You know, the great thing about close reading is there's always one, uh, some other thing that you didn't notice 
And I was actually wondering as I'm like, I'm wondering if anyone else is going to see something in this. Like sometimes if you just pause and take enough time. So thank you. Yes, that's, you're totally right. And I miss that. Um, yeah, Anglo-Saxon, whatever, that nonsense that's being created now. Anyway, okay. I think we're going to have to thank you most profusely, Michelle, for an excellent talk. A fantastic afternoon's work here and morning's work for you, obviously. Um, so I don't know if we can applaud. I'm going to applaud you. So if everyone can somehow make their applause known, but thank you very much, Professor Burnham. Thank, thank you, Philip. Thank you everyone for, for listening and hanging in on the, the long Zoom time. I've really enjoyed it.